Every year, Time Magazine features the person of the year on the cover of their magazine. And they choose a person who had the most influence over our culture, and they spent a lot of time in the headlines throughout the year. And this year, it was no surprise that they chose Taylor Swift, right? Her heiress tour was all over the news. It made history. It generated over a billion dollars. And many people have been featured on the cover over the years, from Elon Musk to Donald Trump to the Pope to Mark Zuckerberg. But in 2006, that was a huge year. That was a monumental year because the Time Magazine person of the year was me. And yes, you heard that right. I was the person of the year in 2006. That was on my resume for here. I peaked in high school. That was one of my biggest accomplishments. But I wasn't alone because you were on there with me. And so were you and you and you. Because in 2006, the Time Magazine person of the year was you. And that's because that year, millions of people were generating content online from YouTube to Facebook to MySpace. Anybody remember MySpace? Is that just me? And online blogs and all that. But if you fast forward to today, it's millions and actually billions of people putting out content every day in hopes to become an influencer and a full-time content creator. I'll give you an example. I don't know about you. I have way too many friends with podcasts. Everyone has something to say. I can't even keep up with all of my friends who are putting out podcasts and and, and saying their opinions. But here's the problem. There is so much information and knowledge at our fingertips. You can get on social media and, and you get on TikTok and someone will say, here's five reasons why fruit is essential for weight loss. And you watch the video and you go, I should go to the store and get some fruit. Until you scroll to the next video and it's like, here's why fruit is toxic and it's killing you and it's making you gain weight. And then the next video is like, here's why eggs are a great source of protein. You need to be eating eggs. And the next one's like, eggs are killing you. And you're like, what do I think? What do I believe? You got financial guys that get on there and they all say different things. They're like, you know, you need to focus on getting out of debt quick. And then the other one's like, no, you need to focus on on the stock market and day trading. And I'll tell you what the answer is. Take all your money and just buy Bitcoin. That's the answer, right? Everyone has something to say. And in this age of information, there's one thing we need that that not many people are pursuing, and that's wisdom. There's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom. So you can know all sorts of information. You can Google anything and get an answer. But knowing everything does not always lead to a good life that's filled with good choices. And you know... I really think that's what the book of James is really about. This is the theme. It's not about what you know. It's how you live. And in today's passage, here's what's happening. James is laying out two kinds of wisdom. You have the wisdom from the world, and you have the wisdom from above. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look at both of them. We're going to put them on the scale and see what they're all about. So today's passage is very short. It's literally just five short verses that are at the end of chapter three, and these are not very popular. There's not a lot of sermons on this kind of stuff. These verses tend to kind of get swept under the rug. They're put in a different kind of category, and I'm going to be honest with you. When I was putting together this sermon series and looking at the calendar, and I I looked at these verses, and I go, ah, I think I just might kind of breeze through them, or maybe I'll just skip this passage and kind of move on and shorten the series. But the thing is, the more I read these verses and the more I kind of meditated on it, I started to realize the weight behind them of understanding and and, and what they mean and how important it is to apply it to our lives. And what's happening in this little section of scripture is James is going to hold up a mirror to our souls. He's going to shine a light in the darkness in our lives. And you might say like, oh, great. I didn't come here to get exposed today by God. And I get it, but here's what's going on. God is going to shine a light on the path you're walking on today. And you're going to see some things. You're going to go, you know what? I'm doing that right. Amen. Like, that's awesome. And then there's going to be other things you go, oh, I really struggle in that area. I need to work on that. And it's a good thing to be exposed in that way. But before we look at these five verses and see how it applies to your life, let's take a moment and pray together. Jesus, I want to thank you so much for this church and for this time of teaching, Lord. And as we come into this passage, we don't want head knowledge. We want changed hearts. 
We don't just want to sit here and learn something new. We want to take this word and apply it, God, so that we could be changed. And I want to pray right now for all the teens that are on the youth retreat down in Keswick right now, because right now they are being preached to at the same time by Matt. And I pray you would speak through him with power and authority, that you would make an impact in the lives of every single one of those teens out there. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. This is my first retreat without them. I'm having major FOMO and I miss them dearly, but I'm sure Matt's doing a great job. Let's look at this passage. In verse 13 of James 3, if you have your Bible, open it or I'll have it up on the screen. It says this, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. So the first thing I want to do is just give you some context right off the bat. What's James talking about? Well, right in the beginning of this passage, James is addressing people who want to become teachers. And the reason why he's doing it is because in that culture, you know, the rabbis and the teachers were elevated in society. They were revered. They were renowned. People loved them. So naturally, everybody wants to be a teacher. Everyone wants to be a rabbi. They want the honor. They want the esteem. And James is drawing a line And we talked about this last week, and he's saying you have to understand the weight and the responsibility and the accountability behind that calling. And he's saying, with that context in mind, let's look at your life. Who is wise among you? Now, you might be here today. If I were to say, raise your hand if you have wisdom, I don't know if any of us would really raise our hand, but you might say, well, how do I achieve that? How do I accomplish obtaining wisdom? And the way it starts It begins with how you see God and where you stand before him. Look at what Proverbs says. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And what this really looks like is you're not living life on your terms anymore, right? You're not going your own way and following your own path. You live with this purpose because you know, hey, God's up to something and I want to be a part of it. You've experienced the overwhelming grace of Jesus and you live according to it. I'll give you an example. You know, when I was in Bible college, it was, it was pretty rigorous in the beginning, especially, and you had to bring your Bible to class, but you couldn't get away with bringing this Bible, okay? You'd get in trouble for that. You have to have the hardcover New American Standard Study Bible. It had to be the one that they issue you, and they give you a ton of reading to do, Bible reading and, and Bible exams and Bible papers to write, and they would give you an empty map and say, map out you know, this part of the Bible, and it's, it's a lot. And what happened was, was the Bible became a textbook very quickly. The Bible became academic and cold and impersonal, and that's not what Scripture is meant to be. And if that's what your devotional life looks like, it needs to change. The Bible is not a textbook. It's a love story of God redeeming a broken world. And you shouldn't just read Scripture with this intention of, I'm going to boost my intellect, but no, you're you're going to renew your mind. You're going to build intimacy with Jesus because this is about a relationship. And we all understand relationships, right? They're personal. They're emotional. They're intense. They're powerful. They could be messy and beautiful because Jesus, as you're reading scripture, starts to become the treasure of your heart. That's the goal. And in verse 14, James shines a light on the wisdom of the world. He exposes it for what it is. And what he says about it in their culture is the exact same thing for our culture today. Look what he says, if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. When you see someone succeed in life and they start to get recognition for it, how does that make you feel? You know, you might have a friend that calls you and says, guess what, I got a promotion and I got a new office. And you're like, congratulations. You know, you're you're thinking, why didn't I get that? I work harder than them. I, I, I'm more spiritual than them. Why is the blessing going to them and not to me? You might see someone who's on social media and they have a huge following and you go, but I'm prettier than them. Or, or I'm more interesting. Their life is boring. Why wouldn't they follow me? But maybe you're not here and you're saying, I, I, you, know, you, you might say, I don't want to be famous. I don't want validation from big groups of people. But you might even want that one person to see you a certain way. And James says, you need to be careful about that envy. You got to put that in check. Be careful about this selfish ambition that makes us want to chase after the things that other people have. Because it's in our nature to look at what someone else has and says, not only do I want that, I'm going to change my whole life to get it. 
And I want to look at this word selfish ambition that James uses because it comes from the Greek word erethiu. And the literal translation of this word is spinning wool, which means making up stories. And it's a word that's used to refer to someone who's running for political office. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Politicians spend so much money promoting themselves. I just read this morning that Biden and Harris just raised like a monument. I think they set a record for how much money they raised last month alone. Millions, I think it was $58 just in January. And they're gonna put that money to good use, aren't they? Promoting themselves. That's what politics is all about. They, you know, everyone, every politician just makes promises that maybe they have no intention of keeping. They will say and do anything just to obtain your vote. I'm not a politics guy. I've never been a big politics guy. You ask me my opinion, I'm not going to dazzle you. I really don't have much to say, but a few years ago, I did get invited to a photo op where there was a congressman, and so I was, I was there a little early, and he showed up, and he was probably the meanest guy ever, like just wanted nothing to do with anybody. He was on his phone. He was yelling at his, his advisor, but the second the cameras came out, oh my goodness, the charm was insane. I'm like, my goodness, like that was amazing. It was like a switch. And what James is saying is that could be us sometimes. It's possible for us to do that. We, we campaign without realizing it to get people to like us and get people on our side. And we see this more and more in our culture. And that's why Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Again, eretheu, or vain conceit, rather in humility, which is the opposite, value others above yourself. See, the wisdom of the world says, you need to look out for you. You gotta watch out for yourself. You gotta get people on your side. You need to make sure that people like you. And it's self-centered, and beyond self-centered, it's self-promoting. And, and when we do that, it makes us compare ourselves constantly to other people, especially social media. It just makes us compare our lives to other people, and it causes this bitterness to form and envy and jealousy, and it's anti-gospel. And it, and it stops us, you know, because when we puff ourselves up and we care so much about our image, it becomes less about God and more about me. And when we have this mindset, it's hard to do things in ministry because it's gonna affect our image. So for example, oh, I can't share my faith with that person. What if they think that I'm weird? That's gonna hurt my image. I can't post that Bible verse. What if I offend someone? Or, or what if I lose followers over it? It becomes less about Jesus and more about our image. And so James is talking about this wisdom of the world. And in verse 15, he says, such wisdom doesn't come from heaven. It's earthly, it's unspiritual, and he uses this word demonic. What does that make you think of? See, when, when you hear the word demonic, you might think of a horror movie. You know, you might think of scary images, but it's not. It's demonic in the sense that it's also attractive to you. And you might justify it and say, I'm just chasing the bag. I'm just trying to make my money. I'm trying to be successful. I have goals. I'm just trying to focus on getting what's mine. James says, this is pride right here. And now the focus isn't God's will being done. You're so focused on your will being done. And I love what Jesus has to say about it. He gives a parable in Luke chapter 12 about a rich man who has a big farm, and he goes, what should I do with all my money? Could you imagine having that problem? Have you ever had that? What do I do with all this money I have? The world would love for you to have that problem. And he goes, I know, I'll build a bigger barn, and I'll build more stuff you know, just more room to make more stuff and fit it in my barns. And God says, you fool, you're going to die this very night and who gets all that stuff? And what do you have to show for your life? What, are you gonna be the richest guy in hell? What kind of flex is that? And if you, if you didn't understand anything of what I just said, let me put it in one sentence. See, the problem that James is identifying is this. The world wants to come alongside you and press you into a mold and get you moving that way, like everybody else, and get you thinking that way, just like everybody else. And Jesus says, hey, go this way, and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is what repentance looks like. This is what salvation looks like. Jesus said, hey, hey, go, go this way. Amen. Think of it like this. A boat on the water is a great thing, but when the water gets in the boat, it starts to sink. A Christian in the world is a great thing, but when the world gets into the Christian, that Christian starts to sink in the same way because they start getting dragged down by the same things that everyone else does. 
You know, according to the U.S. Department of Treasury, I've learned that there's approximately $70 million of counterfeit bills in circulation in the country right now. That means that one out of every 10,000 bills in our nation is not legitimate. It's fake. And the most counterfeited bill is the $20 bill. So what, what's, what's happening is there's currency all around us that looks like the real thing. It feels like the real thing, but in reality, it's not what it appears to be. And isn't that what James is saying? There's wisdom all around you in the world that says, hey, go this way. But the destination is not good. Proverbs says there's a way that's going to seem right, but in the end it leads to death. But the wisdom from above leads you in a different direction. It leads you to a gospel-centered life. So what does wisdom from above look like? Well, it starts in verse 17. We learn the characteristics of godly wisdom, and the first one is to be pure. It's pure. Pure is set apart from the others. He says, first of all, pure, because it's so important. See, you could be very smart, you could be very clever, you could be very successful, but if you've allowed immorality to enter into your life, you lack wisdom. So you need to make sure, first and foremost, is there any of that immorality in your life? Is there any motives that you have that aren't pure? And that's why Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. James says, godly wisdom is gentle or considerate. Another word is meek. If people were to describe you and describe your personality, how many of them would use the word gentle? You know, when I first started working at this church, I was, I was 20 years old. So I was the youth director at 20 years old. I just got done being a teenager myself. And I met with Pastor Tom, our former pastor, every week on Thursday at 11 a.m., every week for years. And in the beginning, I said the most stupid things every week. Not because, like, I'm a stupid guy. It's just, listen, I was working through my theology. I'm trying to make sense of different things. And so I'm in a meeting with Pastor Tom, and we were talking about something uh, related to spiritual warfare. And I said, well, you know, Pastor Tom, demons are just metaphorical in the Bible. And he's like, what? I said, yeah, you know, Christians just want to blame the devil for their dumb mistakes to feel better about themselves. There's no literal demons, Now, for context, if anyone on staff said that to me, they wouldn't leave before I sit down with them and grill them about the Bible and say all these different verses that say the latter. But Pastor Tom just did one of these, huh? Classic Pastor Tom, just, "Hmm," right? Didn't say anything. Not long after that meeting, I experienced spiritual warfare firsthand in ministry. I saw something that was demonic, and it woke me up real quick. And I go running into Pastor Tom. Pastor Tom, I was wrong. You know what he did? He just slid a book to me that was sitting on his desk. Just wait. He just slid that book. And he says, I knew this day would come. Welcome to ministry. It was so gentle. He was my Mr. Miyagi. He was my Yoda if Yoda was like six feet tall. Meekness is not the same thing as weakness. We've talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount. Think of it like a Ferrari with all that horsepower, and you could rev your engine, but what if you're in a 25-mile-per-hour school zone? You better pull it back. It's power under control. Like Philippians 2, Jesus had all this power, yet he humbled himself and took on the role of a servant, and he washed people's feet, and he died on a cross. How much more should we humble ourselves? And you might be here today and you're the kind of Christian that says, I'm not afraid to call out people on their sin. I'll call someone out right now. I don't care. I'll tell them how it is. I don't care about their feelings. I don't care if I'm being harsh. I'm going to tell you to repent and I'm going to be in your face about it. And you might have really good intentions and it might be effective, but wisdom is being gentle and leading people. So let me put it to you like this. The Bible is not meant to be a tool to hit someone upside the head with. That's not how we're supposed to treat the word of God. Gentleness is saying, God, I want to submit my life to you. God, it's not about me. I'm going to wait for you. I'm going to wait for your timing. I know you have things that you want me to do, and I'll move when you tell me to move. But in the meantime, I'll, I'll, I'll stack the chairs. I'll clean the toilets. There's no job that's beneath me, God. The next characteristic of godly wisdom is to have an openness to reason or to be submissive. Another translation will say, willing to yield. We might have a hard time with that one. Willing to yield. This is New Jersey. We don't yield. We would, I'd rather die than let someone merge in my lane. 
But an openness to reason means that you are teachable. It means that you're open to learning. You have to be willing to admit that sometimes you're not always right. It's being able to admit, hey, I might be stubborn right now, and I think I know what's going on, but I need to let God speak truth and hold loosely onto my opinions. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, church. I'm going to admit this is a struggle for me. I have very, very stern views about things that I will not bend on no matter what. I'll give you an example. I could be on a deserted island in the middle of nowhere, literally starving to the point of death. And if you miraculously pulled up into a boat to rescue me, holding a box of pizza with my name on it, I would not eat it if there was pineapple on it. Because I stand for what's right. If you don't stand for something, you fall for everything. I don't bend. Pineapple does not belong on the pizza. I do not compromise. How many times in your life have you rejected counsel because you said, no, 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 I've always done it this way. I know more than you. I know what I'm talking about. You're just a kid. Or maybe you're being stubborn with God. God, I'm not going to change my mind about this person. I don't, I don't care what, they, what, what, what they're doing now. I don't like them. I don't forgive them. I don't want anything to do with them. True wisdom is being open to reason and seeing things through God's perspective. And when I was a youth pastor, I really saw myself more as like a bridge to bridge the gap between parents and teens. So if you had a parent and a teen that are at odds and they can't connect and they can't communicate, I would come in and help them. And so there was a time when I sat down with a teen girl and she said, I'm having a really hard time with my parents. Every time we have a conversation, they don't even let me get a full sentence out before they jump on me and start yelling at me or lecturing me. And it makes it hard for me to listen to them when I'm not being heard. And I said, okay, well, I'll sit down. I'll talk with your parents. So I met with her parents, and I said this. I said, hey, the next time you sit down with your daughter, just let her get a sentence out. Just, just let her explain her heart and, and say what she needs to say and then respond because when you're doing that, she's going to feel heard, and she's going to be more likely to listen to you as well. It would have been nice if I could actually say that to these parents, but I couldn't because the second I started... I was interrupted with, how dare you tell me how to raise my kid, right? We have to admit, especially parents, we don't have all the answers. God does. Amen. He sees the map of our lives. He watches over our paths, and he knows when our ways aren't correct, and we don't. And that's why we have to be willing to put our ways aside for him. Amen. Now, I just want to pause here for a moment, just in case I've lost anybody, because we've covered a lot so far. See, in this passage, James is contrasting the difference between wisdom of the world and wisdom from God. Wisdom of the world is all about you and about your pride and your ego, and it leads to your downfall. The wisdom of God leads to a gospel-centered life because it's pure, it's gentle, it's open to reason. You with me so far, church? Amen. Amen. Okay. The next one is to be sincere. You need to say what you mean. You need to mean what you say. And this comes from the Greek word a hypocrites, a meaning without, and hypocrites meaning hypocrisy, meaning don't be a hypocrite. And in the literal sense, a hypocrite was an actor that would get on stage that would be wearing a, a mask that would portray an emotion. And sometimes we do this with our lives. Not so much kids. Kids don't do this. Teens don't really do it either. You don't have to wonder if a kid likes you or not. They'll just tell you, I don't like you. But as we get older, we learn how to put the mask on and pretend that we're fine when we're not. We pretend to like people we can't stand and say things we don't mean. And I got to tell you, if this is something you struggle with today, let me put it to you like this. Being a hypocrite might work for you, okay? It, it, it might make it easier for you to get what you want, but there's a better way. James says to be sincere, to be authentic, to be humble, to be kind, and then people will be drawn to you. You know, think of it like this. Nothing drives people out of the church faster than hypocrisy. And the next characteristic is to be peaceable or a lover of peace. And I love what Proverbs chapter 3 has to say about it because wisdom leads to peace in our lives. That when you walk in wisdom, you experience this peace and this rest. And look at what it says, and your sleep will be sweet. If you struggle with sleeping, this might be a wisdom issue, 
Not an ambient solution. It's the, 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 the solution should be wisdom. Think about this. If you struggle with a good night's sleep, hear me on this. Today is St. Patrick's Day. It's also my wife's birthday, my little leprechaun over there in the nursery. <laughs> but St. Patrick is the perfect example of this piece. I was reading about it this week, that in his day in Ireland, it was divided among these small clans. And these small clans would run into each other and they'd get into a fight. They'd start warring with each other unexpectedly. And so after spending the whole day fighting and fearing for their lives, the only way that these men could go to sleep is taking the Irish exit and just pounding down some shots, right? They just get so drunk that they naturally fall asleep. But Patrick... He always slept so soundly, even though he was always being threatened by kings and priests who were out to kill him and who hated him, he always slept soundly because he lived in wisdom, and that wisdom brought peace in his life. And that's why Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called my children. James says that godly wisdom means that you are impartial. It means you don't show favoritism. Now, I won't go super deep into this one because we did a whole message on this a few weeks ago. In James chapter two, James goes into more detail talking about how we need to treat people equally, not judging someone based on what race they are or their ethnicity or whether they're rich or poor or a sinner or a saint. We are all one, and so you need to show people equal treatment. But the last one that James says is to be a lover of mercy and produce good fruit. You know, sometimes we get so mad at people for the things that that they do. And it's right to be mad sometimes. And we say, I want the wrath of God to come upon them. God, smite them. But what what would it be like for you if God saved them instead? What would it be like for you if your enemies started coming here and worshiping Jesus? A lover of mercy. You know, when I was a new believer, I was going to this church And I just wanted to serve in youth ministry. And they wouldn't let me. And I said, I'll just come in and sweep the floor when you guys are done. We don't want you here. And I never understood why until later on when I found out that their youth leadership team had some people on there who knew me in high school and knew some of the things that I did and some of the things that I was about, and they didn't let me serve. And in the same way, sometimes our pride and our bias can prevent us from extending the mercy of God to other people. And that's why in Matthew, Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And I don't know if you've picked up on it by now, but there's a beatitude to go with every single one of what James is saying. We look at people and we judge their actions because that's all we see, but God knows their heart. God knows their story. And that's why Jesus can change a man named Saul into Paul and change the world. And if you're here today and you struggle with this, ask the Lord to help you to see people through his eyes, through his eyes worldview and gain that wisdom. And so just to put it all in perspective, James says that the wisdom from above is gentle. It's open to reason. It's sincere. It's peaceable. It shows equal treatment and it loves mercy. How do you stack up with this list? Let's look at you. How how many of these characteristics would you say describes you today? You You might look at this list and go, oh man, I have so much work to do. God, I need to be more gentle. I don't know what's up with me. I always got my gloves up with people. I'm always ready to defend myself and fight people. God, I need to be more teachable. I need to be humble. I have to admit that I don't know everything. I just know mostly everything. I need to show mercy to people instead of having these unreachable expectations of people. And you might read this list and you get so bummed out. You get so discouraged. But my goal for you is that you would read this list and you would see the gospel that you would see what it means to live a gospel-centered life. And when you look at this and you see the gospel, this is Jesus. Jesus was perfect in keeping all of this. And that same Jesus is within you today, giving you the strength to achieve this in your life. It's not, I need to do better. It's, I need more of Christ. The Bible says that you can have the mind of Christ. You know what that means? It means that you can walk with him, think like him, feel like him, see like him, and live like him because you have the mind of Jesus. And if you're here and you're like, oh, I want that wisdom, what do I do? James says right in week one how to do it. James 1 verse 5, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, just ask God for it. 
How many times is God standing by like, I want to help, I want to help, but you're so busy trying to do your own thing. Just ask for wisdom and he will give it to you. You know, I love this verse because it shows there's no secret tip for spiritual growth. There's no shortcuts. There's no spiritual steroid injection that's going to give you holy gains overnight, right? You just need to be in the word every day, Amen. every day. And then take what you read and apply it to your life. Be spending time in prayer every single day. Live that gospel-centered life. You know, recently I was, I was at the gym and I, this, this story is going to make me sound like such a creep. <laughs> Maybe I am. I don't know. I, I was working out, and I noticed this guy across from me. He's on the leg press machine. And he took these 45-pound plates and started throwing them on the machine, just one after another. And he's going, and he's going, and he gets to the point where he takes the last plate, and it won't fit, so he has to put it back. And he goes to the other side, and he starts doing the same thing. He starts stacking 45-pound plates. And I'm just watching, like, is this guy for real right now? And he just keeps going until... He can't fit the last one on. The only way he could add more weight is if he were to come over and ask me to get on top of the thing. And I would. I mean, I'm thinking there's no way this guy can lift it. It's over 1,000 pounds. This is insane. He doesn't look like the kind of guy that can do this. And so I just watched like a creep. And I saw this guy pump out like 10 reps. He'd be so uncomfortable if he knew that I was talking about him in church today. And I was like, I got to say something to this guy. I don't talk to anybody at the gym. I just kind of hide and do my own thing. But I, I got to say something to Some of you are looking at me so weird. I didn't walk up like, hey, those are some nice gams. I, it wasn't like that. I just walked up to him and I said, congratulations. You get to go home now. He goes, what do you mean? I was like, you did it. You reached the top. There's no more weight you could do. Like you hit the goal. You're done. You get to go home. And he started to laugh and he said, it's not about the weight that you can put up. It's the discipline. It's the state of mind. And we're talking, he said some more things. And, and, and that sentence, it just stuck with me. Because at first I didn't understand it. And it's probably just because I'm not really passionate about a leg press. I don't really care. But I started to think of what he said in the terms of the church. And it started to make sense. See, we could have a service just like this and it could lead to a, rev a revival right here on a Sunday morning, and we could see hundreds of people walk into the door, through the doors, and, and, and the Spirit moves, and people come to Christ, and other people come to repentance, and it's this big movement of God. But I want you to know this. No matter how powerful of a service it is, the next day I have a blank page to write a new message. And Kay is going to pick out a whole new worship set. And Deo is going to come in and he's going to sweep the floor, and Mark is going to print more bulletins and straighten out the chairs, and we're going to do it again next week. And, and then the next week, and Lord willing, then the week after that, and we're never going to stop because it's never been about the numbers. It's about that discipline and a state of mind because here at this church, we keep it simple. This is what we're about. We're going to love Jesus with everything we got, and we're going to love our people, and we're going to love this community. We're going to impact this town because this is where God has placed us. And we've been here as a church doing this for over 170 years as a church, and God is still not done with us yet. And as long as this building stands, as long as these people come, as long as we have breath in our lungs, we're gonna worship Jesus, we're gonna love him, we're gonna love people, and we're gonna impact this community. And in the same way, 170 years, and we're still, just, I feel like we're just getting started. In the same way, no matter how long you've been a Christian, God is just getting started with you. He's got plans for you. He's got plans for your journey, and we're all in this together, and I am so grateful to God for each and every one of you that God has brought here to this church, and my prayer is that you would let him use you. Let him speak into your soul, and let him pour out his wisdom into your life. Let's pray together. Jesus, I want to thank you for this time that we could learn from you and learn from your word. God, there are so many voices that call out to us and lead us in different directions, but you say the sheep will hear my voice. So I pray you would help us to be in tune with you today. Lord, would you give us wisdom beyond our years, not only as a church, but individually, so that we can live a life that reflects your sacrifice on the cross. God, help us to draw close to you so that we can know all that we need to be holy, to be set apart. God, give us the discipline and the state of mind that it takes to persevere in our faith. 
And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.